Okay, everyone. What's that? <laughs> uh, you have the clicker, right? Who, who has it? Oh, whoever wants to control it. I, I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, uh, before we head out, to uh, answer a few questions. Um, but before we do so, let's have a, a quick round of prayer. Abba Father, we thank you uh, for uh, your presence uh, that we have been experiencing in our midst, in spite of the fact that we do not deserve it because you are a holy God and we are sinful creatures. And Father, we thank you for each one here and for this fellowship that we have been able to gather here uh, peacefully. And I pray that you would uh, continue to be with us uh, as we spend a few moments answering a few questions. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, let's go to the first slide. Well, this is one of the questions that, uh, uh, as you probably know, we've been doing uh, some questions and answers lately. And I had uh, this uh, uh, person uh, who sent us uh, an email saying, uh, Pastor, how do you pre uh, prepare for the coming crisis? Some tips for us. Thank you, sir. I thought that was a very interesting question in light of everything that we have been experiencing. How do we prepare for the coming crisis? If I were to ask you that question, what would be your answer, or at least some of your answers. Conversion. What's that? Conversion. Conversion. All right. Conversion. Prayer. What else? Prayer. Prayer. What else? Country living. Yeah. Yeah. Country living. That's uh, that's the physical aspect of the preparation. Yes. Country living. Preparing physically. Preparing physically. What else? Say again. Storing up food, that's physical as well, yep, uh, because we were counseled to uh, uh, make preparation for the little time of trouble, for the little time, not the great time of trouble, but for the little time of trouble. Why not the great time of trouble? Ah, very good, very good, because we, we won't need... We won't need the uh, physical food, and I'll explain more. We won't need the physical food, uh, because as you mentioned, God will provide for us. And also, at that time, everything that we have will be taken away from us, including our country dwelling. And the reason why I said we won't need the physical food is because God himself will provide manna as he provided manna in the wilderness for the children of Israel. Did you know that? It's the same thing that's going to happen again. God will provide manna for his people in the wilderness. That's why the Bible says your bread and your water shall be sure. But another passage that came to my mind is Isaiah chapter 56 uh, verses, no I'm sorry, Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 11. It's a very familiar passage. I'm sure once you see it, you'll recognize it. Where the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man is taught. And let him return unto the Lord. And he shall have mercy upon him unto our God. And he shall abundantly pardon. That is part of the preparation that we must do. To seek the Lord while he may be found. To seek him like we've never done this before. Also on the screen, go to the next slide. Spirit of Prophecy says, from Review and Herald, June 21st, 1906, we are to have clear spiritual discernment. Else we shall fail or of understanding the opening providences of God that are preparing the way for us to enlighten the world. The great crisis is just before us. Now is the time for us to sound the warning message. So what else should we be doing right now spreading the, gospel. spreading the gospel by the agencies that god has given us for this purpose let us remember that one most important agency is our what medical missionary work as we were talking about the health message earlier never are we to lose sight of the great object for which our sanitariums are established 
the advancement of God closing work in the earth. So another preparation for the final crisis is, she mentioned the medical missionary work. Whenever you see those words, medical missionary work, she's referring to health message as well. She's referring to a diet reform. And that is part of the physical preparation. You see, a Christ before, he, he faced his crisis. He, he had to um, sub, submit to God. And how did he do this? He surrendered his appetite, the desire of the flesh. Remember, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. You know, uh, temperance in all things. So Christ had to gain the victory over his appetite before he could meet the crisis. Now, let's move on. We don't have that much time. Let's move on. Uh, the next question says, I have another question. What do you think about background checks being done in the church in order to serve in any leadership position or position at all? This I see a, as a worldly policy. Have you heard of something like that before? You've never heard? Well, in America, um, it's very common for uh, our conferences. Now, it wasn't like that before, but it was very common now for um, those positions, uh, if not all positions, to have a criminal background check. What do you think about us as a church, having um, a criminal background church of our, well, let's maybe put it this way, of our members uh, before he could become an elder or, or so on and so forth. Yes. Very good point. If they have changed, you cannot base uh, your decision uh, uh, based on what that person has done in the past, yeah, so right? The criminal record will always be there. It will always be against that person. Yeah, so if you repent, what takes the away? Very good, very good. Okay, in addition to what you just said, very good answer, very good. In addition to what you just said, think about each one of us. The Bible says of us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if God were to ask for a criminal background check, we, we will all be in trouble. Yes. And remember also, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to confess us, to forgive us of all unrighteousness, right? All sins. And he will throw those sins into the deepest part of the ocean. Yes. As if we had never sinned, right? As if we had never sinned. That means we have a new record now. Yeah. We have a new record. But when it comes to worldly policy, those work records are still there. Imagine someone uh, who uh, had killed someone or who had uh, raped someone, right? That person was sentenced to prison. And that person, uh, let's say, person was sentenced to 15 years, right? But while being in prison, that person, he or she, surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Truly, from the heart, confessed their sins and uh, was converted. And as a result of their conversion to Christ Jesus, uh, they started living a different life in prison, while still in prison. And to the point where they observe that person's conduct. They observe that person's conduct. You know, sometimes if you are sentenced for 15 years, if you have good conduct, they can reduce it, right? And then as a result of that person's conduct, they reduce the sentence to 10 years, let's say. And 10 years later, that person gets out of jail. So are we going to hold that record against that person? Well, in some cases, yes. So, let me come to 
us as a church adapting this worldly policy. Why we have such power? As a matter of fact, I read something like that not too long ago that there was a conference here doing the same thing. Where did that policy come from? Well, it's because we have been yielding to worldly policies and worldly demand. Like in the U.S., for example, the conferences do that because they have a partnership with the government. They have a, what is called 501c3. And so the government requires that, and so they yield to that. But that is a worldly policy. It condemns the sinner for the crime that the sinner once made. Now, granted, or did, granted, there are a lot of uh, bad people out there, right? But this is where God and faith comes in. For example, let me read this for you on the screen. This says, from Life Sketches 314, those connected with our leading institutions, notice she said institutions with an S, that means all of them, having a vital connection with Christ, the true vine, patterning after the world and adapting a worldly policy must be guarded against. Right? That must be guarded against. We should not adapt worldly policies. And then it says, men in responsible positions should go to God as often as did Daniel in earnest supplication for divine help. Okay, there it is. If someone comes to you, let's say you have a job opening at one of our institutions, or if it's an elder or a position or whatever, well, go to God in prayer. Put the matter before God. You see, how did the disciples replace Judas? Did they do a background check? A criminal background check? They, the, the church selected two men and then they prayed and cast lot to see which one of those two that God uh, would want to replace Judas with, uh, with, right? They did not go into a criminal background. We pray to God. Notice another passage from this, on the screen. This is from the General Conference Bolton, April 3rd, 1901. It is not for men in any part of the world, in any line of his work, to depart from God's principles in any business trans transaction. God wants the world to see that business can be carried on in accordance with the principles that mark the character of God in Christ. You see it? Let, let me pause here. You, you, you know what came to my mind as I was reading this? The Apostle Paul. He was Saul before, remember? And when he was Saul before he became Paul, what kind of person was he? A murderer, right? He was persecuting the church of God. Do you realize to the point when the Apostle Paul came and, and uh, was professing... Uh, his uh, conversion in Christ Jesus, the Christians, didn't, the, the apostles, they, they were afraid to receive him. They did not want to receive him because they did not believe. They, they, they see him as Paul the persecutor. They say, hey, this is a trick. You see, this is a trick. But they had to put their faith in God. To, even uh, when, after God uh, knocked him off his horse, remember that in Acts, the book of Acts? And then, uh, God uh, said to uh, uh, Ananias to go and help Paul. Uh, well, he was Saul then. And go and help him. Now, Ananias was telling God something God did not know. Uh, Lord, this is the same man who's been persecuting you, uh, your people and so on and so forth. As if God did not know that. <laughs> you know, as if, as if this, this was news to God. <laughs> God. What did God say to him? Uh, yes, I know about it. <laughs> I have chosen him. I know. You see, God did not say, listen, uh, you write Ananias, let's ask for a criminal background from Paul. God already knew that. Let's continue to read. It goes on to say, what are God's commandments? They are all, they are the wall which is built around his people. So, in the Bible, wall represents the law or the commandments of God. There is to be no departure from his principles, no bringing in of worldly 
policy principles, no worldly customs or practices are to be brought in for these people who are to be representatives of Christ to follow. When we keep the commandments of God, we are in touch with God and he is connected with us. When we do things like that, it's because we have no faith. We don't believe in the power of prayer. We don't believe that God can tell us, can answer our prayers and say, okay, this is the one you should hire. This is the one you should put in that position. But today, yeah, because of worldly policies, our churches, for the most part, have adapted this system, a criminal background. So you have to be, let's say, in, in good order in order for you to occupy certain positions in the church. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ because we are all sinners. Now, the next one on the screen here is a comment, not a uh, question. Now, this was dealing with a question that was asked to me last Sabbath over a week ago. And this, this was about um, dreadlocks. You know dreadlocks? Yes. Uh, I was asked a question about dreadlocks. And uh, the person was asking, is it biblical, something like that, if I remember the question correctly, uh, to, to have dreadlocks for men to, to do that? And I did answer that question, but uh, I will talk about it a little bit more. But this person says here, uh, in regard to that same question, it says, Rastafarism is a religious belief by Rastas. They believe in... Uh, Hail Selassie, Hail Selassie, who they consider to be God, little g. The hair is a vow that they took to be part of the religion. It's called the Nazarene vow to maintain the tradition of lock hair. So if someone becomes a true Christian to follow Christ, then they should remove this excessive hair to renounce the religion, cut it off. Why hold on to the idea and be a Christian as well? You can serve two masters. Well, I'm thinking to say you cannot serve two masters. That is true. It is a religion. And I appreciate this person adding that to the answer that I gave. It is a religion. When, when you join the church, if that was a lifestyle you were living before, and knowing where that came from, like Bob Marley, for example, you know, I grew up, you know, when I grew up on the island around the Rastafarism, you know, lots of guys listening to Bob Marley and they had the dreadlocks and all of those things. I remember those things. And then they were smoking as well. <laughs> they, were, they were like chimneys. They, they were more, and, and I know, whenever I see somebody, I, I don't judge people, but whenever I see somebody with uh, uh, dreadlocks, that's what it reminded me of when I was a little boy growing up. I remember those, those people uh, um, with dreadlocks, and there was not one of them that did not smoke drug. There was not one of them. All of them, as I remember it correctly, all of them. And that was the religion. They and their leader was Bob Marley. Bob Marley was their leader. And, and that's, that, you ask them, hey man, uh, you know, it, 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 Bob Marley, this and that, and the other. So, and another thing is, it has the hygiene problem. Because they would go for a very, very long period of time and not washing the hair. You see, not washing there. And it, in addition to that, it does not look good. Now, the question that one must ask himself, is that glorifying God? Or is that glorifying self? Is it something that I'm doing for myself because this is what I like, what I want? Or is it something that God ordains? You see, there's only two ways in this. It's either the first one I mentioned or the other one. It's either because of God or it's because of self. And if it's because of God, where do you find it in the Bible? Because God requires cleanliness among his people. Now, let me share a passage with you. Matthew 6. Go to Matthew 6. Which, which book we're going to? 
in light of that, let me share Matthew 6 with you. Matthew 6, and notice what the Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Let's begin uh, in Matthew 6. Are you there? Uh, let me back up here to verse 17. Now, the, Jesus here is dealing with fasting, okay? But notice the application here in connection with uh, Rastafarism or dreadlocks. It says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men not to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men not to fast, but unto thy Father which is in heaven, and thy, I'm sorry, which is in secret, and uh, thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, when Jesus says in verse 17, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, Jesus is talking about cleaning the body here as well, washing the hair. You see? Now, notice Jesus did, didn't say, if you fast. It says, when you fast. That means we have to fast sometimes, right? So, when you fast, you should not appear unto men as if, oh, it's so painful. No, you have to, on the outside look of thing, you have to make it appear as if mm, there's nothing going on. You, you make sure you look good on the outside. That's what he's saying. Wash yourself, cleanse your body, wash the hair. But Rastafarianism goes along this. This is a vow, as the, the person said, this is a vow that the person has made to carry this. And God did not tell you to do this. That vow, yes. Our influence is what? Dead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, sure. Right. Which, which was exactly what happened to me, what I remember as a child. So whenever I see somebody... Uh, with dreadlocks, it takes me back to my childhood. That's the first thing that, that came to my mind. And uh, it is not of God. God wants us to have, uh, uh, to have clean bodies uh, from head to toe, right? From head to toe. Anybody? Has, yes. A very good example. You cannot put new wine into an old vessels, right?